Friday. Yeah. And in case you're wondering, he, the Lord deserves praise for that. Yes, he does. The Lord deserves praise. But when that ruling came down, I felt in my spirit uh, strongly that I was supposed to be home this morning. And my dad was supposed to preach, so I called him. And I asked him his thoughts. And after we talked, he agreed that I should be here. And I'm thankful that I have a father who pushes me into my assignment and is understanding and is not offended that he was supposed to preach this morning, but I am. But uh, he will be preaching in two weeks. I've pushed my trip back just two weeks, so he's still going to preach. But I felt in my spirit that I needed to be here because if you've been paying any attention to the words that I use when I'm preaching, if you've been paying any attention toward our heart and the vision of this church, this is something that we are to be involved in and that the Lord is calling the potter's house. No, listen, I'm not, I'm not talking about just the body of Christ. I, I'm, I'm going to make this real personal today. This is something the potter's house is to be involved in. And I'm going to preach to you a message this morning called made for this moment I was created for this moment you were created for this moment I don't want to miss it I said I don't want to miss it go with me if you have your Bible to Esther chapter 4 very quickly they're going to put it on the screen too so if you don't have time to get it Esther chapter 4 verse 13 beginning And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Father, I thank you for your word forever settled in heaven that still speaks to us today. And Lord, I pray that as I preach your word this morning, that you would help me to be bold but yet humble. That you would help me to speak the truth, but speak the truth in love. And Lord, that today, at the end of this service, you will be exalted. And you will be the main attraction. I give you thanks. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Before you sit down, I want you to tell five people you were made for this moment. You can be seated. In Jesus' name. I have um, some things I need to say today. And some of them are going to be difficult. Um, I believe in, in leading authentically. How many of you know the best leaders are, are authentic leaders? And I believe in leading authentically. And I'm not going to lie to you. I didn't sleep much last night. Um, because I know what the Lord is having me to say today. Uh, I sat in my office last night and... In prayer confess to the Lord I didn't know if because when the pressure gets turned up that's when you find out what you're made of and confess to the Lord I I can't do this without you I can't I'm not cut out for this without you and the Lord in that moment he told me to look down and I looked down at my outline and I'm literally fighting what I'm getting ready to preach I was made for this moment I was created for this moment and I'm going to we're gonna head on I'm telling you if secular media can talk about it okay thank you for three people that are with me I said if talking heads can talk about it the church 
ought to be leading the charge today more than any other day. And, and so before I begin, I, I want to address a couple things. Number one, if you're in this room and you've had an abortion, you are loved. You're valued. You are honored. This is a place where God takes broken people and he makes them whole again. This is a place where you can belong, you can heal, and you can become everything God has destined for you to be. Uh, today, and I'm not going to say if, I'm going to say when. When I get passionate and I preach a little hard, I've not come to preach at women who've had an abortion. I've come to deal with the body of Christ today. Some of you just puckered up a little bit. I've come to deal with the body of Christ today. I read a quote from Dallas Willard this week that said some of the worst people to be right are Christians. Some of the worst people to be right are Christians. And, and okay, I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. Uh, let's also address that because the Supreme Court made this decision does not mean that abortions have stopped. It means the conversation has moved back to the states. And whether you like it or not, the, 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 the decision that the Supreme Court levied was a righteous decision. The Bible said in Acts chapter 10, Peter is preaching in the house of Cornelius and he says, any nation that works righteousness and fears the Lord will be accepted by him. So now our prayers turn to the state level. God, raise up state leaders who will ban abortion. Come on. Raise up state leaders who will ban abortion and work righteousness. Uh, I also want to address women in the room today. I find it fascinating that when the devil set out to wage war against humanity, he started with a woman not the man. And he did not start with the woman because of her weakness. He started with the woman because of her womb. Because he knew if I can get the woman, I can get her seed. So, now you see why Abortion is an attack against women because if the devil can get the woman, he can get her seed. That's oh, all, it's real tight in here. Loosen up. The scripture tells us that life begins at conception. Exodus chapter 21 and 22, God himself does not refer to a baby in the womb as a fetus. He refers to it as a child. Go read your Bible. Life begins a conception, not heartbeat. I also want to step out here and I want to, because uh, I'm going to present you with some facts today. But my overarching desire this morning is to present you with the truth. The truth of God's word. God did not call me to be a scientist. He didn't call me to be a researcher. He called me to be a preacher of his gospel. And I'm going to do that today, but I'm also going to use statistics and I'm going to use history and facts to help you understand where we are. I want to deal with a demonic organization called Planned Parenthood for just a minute. I've told you long ago that the way the devil works is not just through outright evil but through deception. So he creates something called Planned Parenthood under the guise of family services that is actually tearing the family unit apart. And, and I'm amazed, hmm, help me Holy Spirit. I am amazed at the amount of preachers and believers who stand against racism, but stand for abortion. 
I am amazed. And let me tell you why. Because the creator of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, was an openly white supremacist who was a racist. Factually detailed, she wrote a letter to a friend and said these words, we do not want the word to go out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. Margaret Sanger was not only against the African American community, but she was against family. In, in the book Woman and the New Race in 1920 in chapter 5, entitled The Wickedness of Creating Large Families, Margaret Sanger is quoted as saying the most merciful thing that a large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. In a study done by the Life Institute, it studied the 25 largest abortion mega centers that they have built. And it found that an alarming 88%, 22 of the 25, are within walking distance of primarily housed women of color. Disturbingly, 80% target black communities. 56% target Hispanic and Latino neighborhoods. 80% target one or more colleges. In total, 24 of 25 of these abortion mega centers target women of color, college women, or both. So let me make it real plain. You cannot be against racism and for abortion. And you cannot be against abortion and openly racist. Okay, I'm trying not to get ahead of myself because I feel very passionate today about what I'm going to say. But I feel like before we go further, I want to set the landscape for you. We were created for this moment. You could have been born in any other time frame any other era any other century but you're alive today and I don't believe God is an accidental God I don't believe God makes mistakes I believe I'm alive for a reason right now the, the Bible said of the culture in the last days it said in 2nd Timothy 3 and 1 beginning this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come Men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And said from such turn away. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and, and verse 3 beginning, the, the apostle Peter writes that, that this know also that many will come in the last days saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers have fallen asleep, things have continued as they were since the beginning. And then in verse 9, the Bible said that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, one promise in the context of this scripture, and that is his coming. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, uh, but is long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all, everybody should out all but that all should come to repentance the only reason the Lord has not come back is because he is long-suffering and he is giving every mother's child the opportunity to not perish without him I, I, I was reading this morning and I was praying this morning in the scripture. I was reminded in Matthew 24, 12 when Jesus is in his, in his dissertation of the latter days uh, to his disciples. Uh, he said these words. He said in the last days because of the increase of wickedness, uh, the love of many would grow cold. And if we have seen anything in the two days since this, the gavel has come down on this, it is that there is a lack of love both in the body of Christ and in the world. We don't know how to talk to each other in love. We don't know how to have conversations in love. We don't know how to be right in love. And the problem is we value being right more than we value being righteous. And, 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 and so he said, the love of many will wax cold. 
I, I was reminded also in prayer this morning that, that Romans chapter 1 is manifesting before us again. In verse 24, Paul writes and he says, Therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sex relations for unnatural ones. Hello? And in the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to their depraved mind. So that they do not know what, so that they do know do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness. God, I pray that you would burden us today for our culture. They become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil and greed and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit and malice. They're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent new ways of being evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. And although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do them, but they approve of those who practice them. We're living in a time Isaiah said it like this in Isaiah 5.20, Woe to them who call evil good and good evil and call light dark and darkness light and put sweet for bitter and bitter for sweet. And so I've, I've set up, I don't have to go much into this. If you're a student of the Bible, if you have any eyeballs and your head's not been buried in the sand, you recognize the moment that we find ourselves in. The moment I want to go back into the Old Testament for a moment I want to show you where this practice of abortion began I want to talk to you about what God hates and I want to talk to you about what the church is responsible for y'all hang with me for a minute I want to talk to you first and foremost about the God named Molech I've got a picture if they want to throw it up. The God named Molech. This is what artists' renditions believe Molech look like in the Old Testament. And the same spirit that operated in these days is alive and well today. According to the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary, Molech, Molech was a Canaanite God who was worshipped primarily by parents burning their children as a sacrifice. Customs appear to be varied. Sometimes it was the oldest son. Sometimes the ashes were built into the family house. As in they were put into a jar and literally placed as the cornerstone of the house. The general idea appears, listen to this, to be the act of sending the child to the realm of the dead prepared the way for the rest of the family to be received by Molech in the afterlife. In other words... Children were sacrificed for the well-being of their parents. Does that sound familiar? The image of Molech was that he was a human figure with a bull's head and outstretched arms, ready to receive children destined for sacrifice. The image of metal was heated red hot by a fire kindled within. And the children laid on its arms until they rolled off into the fiery pit below. In order to drown out the cries of the victims, they would pick up their flutes and their drums and they would play them while a child was sacrificed to a god. 
Mothers, it was reported by historians, would stand by without tears to give the impression that this is a voluntary act of sacrifice. A voluntary offering. God was so displeased with this. I want to teach you because for 400 years the Israelites were surrounded by Canaanite and Egyptian gods. For 400 years the culture of Egypt got into the Israelites. So much so that the Israelites began to practice this very thing. And God, when God brought them out of Egypt, he gave them a law. And in Leviticus 20 and 2, he said, say to the people, any one of the people of Israel or the strangers who sojourn in Israel, who gives any of his children to Molech shall surely be put to death. The people of the land will stone him with stones. I myself will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he has given one of his children to Molech to make my sanctuary unclean and to profane my holy name. Now, that's the act. But I want you to hear what God continued to say. He went on by saying, and if the people of the land... Do at all close their eyes to that man when he gives one of his children to Molech. Then I will set my face against the man and against his clan. And I will cut them off from among their people. Him and all who follow him in whoring after Molech. So the judgment was not just against those who gave their children as a sacrifice. It was against those who watched it and did nothing. It was against those who watched it and were recipients of it. Now, I, as I read this, something in me began to stir because this was not a, a Can this was not an Israelite thing. This was a Canaanite worship that the Israelites took part in. Solomon built an altar to Molech when he married his pagan wives. Do you want to know what happened in the church? What happened in the church is something called mixture. We've built an idol and we call it political correctness. And I got, I got worked up this week looking in, in, in the last couple of days studying this. Uh, that since when did what the world worships become something that the people of God defend? I am not, I didn't come to make you happy or make you feel good this morning. I am not shocked or stunned by the reaction by the world to this judgment that was handed down. I am not shocked by actions and by their response I am stunned that there are Christians who will go to great lengths to justify the murdering of children and will justify defending the atrocity of abortion whatever happened to come out from among them and be separate and in the body of Christ we have lost our fear of God we have lost the fear of the Lord in our and we fear man more than we fear God and we want to appease man and we want to make man like the church and we it's almost like we've never read the gospels when Jesus said in Luke 21 that you will be hated of all men for my name's sake and we try to appease and we try to be exclusive and inclusive and we try to bring them in on the concept of love and that's a good thing but love without the truth is deception and we have failed to preach the truth because preachers, I'm going to get real, uh, because preachers have the fear of man more than they fear God. Preachers have been bought by the biggest tithe payers and the influence of social media. And I sat in this church last night. I sat in this altar and I prayed, God, would you raise up preachers? Would you raise up pastors who don't fear man, but who fear God and who will preach? 
preach the gospel and who will stand up for life and stand up for truth. You can't buy a man who fears God. You can't purchase a man who fears the Lord. The Bible said in Proverbs 29 that the fear of man is a snare, but those who trust in the Lord shall be protected. God give us preachers who will let go of their influence, who will let go of their riches, who will let go of their paychecks and will preach the word unadulterated, unedited. Thus says the Lord. And if I was made for this moment, I've got to be different than the culture of the moment. They ought to be able to look at me and say there's something that is different about him. There's something that is strange about him. Oh, it comes in a deep territory. I posted just one little sentence on Facebook. And let me tell you something. Can I be honest with you? Uh, Facebook, we feel like because we post, we've done something. I'm going to show you here in a minute that just because you type on your little keyboard doesn't mean you've done not one thing. I post one little sentence to let it be known. I am celebrating this. I got. Can I just be straight with you? I'm going to quote, not really fully quote. I got told to F off. I was called disgusting. I got called ignorant. I, I, I got people messaging left and right. And then I got people telling me, oh, this is great. This is perfect. I love this. Preaching to the choir. But can I tell you something? Uh, none of these things move me. The, the truth of God's word. And, and I recognize today that preaching this may make some of you leave and preaching this may affect our giving but can I tell you something you cannot buy me I cannot be bought to your money oh it matters because you know we got to pay the bills and we got to but it doesn't matter to me you know why because I have the fear of the Lord and the Lord I fear owns the cattle on a thousand hills the pillars of the earth are his and he has set the world upon them so your tithe and your offering isn't for me it's for him and if you leave and take it elsewhere the potter's house is going to be all right because they that trust in the Lord shall be protected but the fear of man is a snare when did it become cool to defend what the world calls right I know I run the risk today of sounding antiquated and outdated but the word of the Lord endures forever. And Paul said that the Lord said, come out from among them. Come out from among them. Come out from among them. Be different than they are. Be separated from them. Come out from among them and be separate. And then I will be your God. If we look like they look, if we sound like they sound, if we defend what they defend, then he is not our God. But if I stand on his side and I stand on his word side and I come out from among them and I am separate, then he is then my God. So the spirit of Molech is alive and well. And the problem is, is I fear getting on social media in the next few days and watching pastors with mega influence spew deception. And I, it's like they've never read the word. Because James 3, 1 says that they that teach the word will be held at a higher judgment. Do you know why I preach like this this morning? I'm going to have to stand before God for what I say to you today. You don't have to stand before God for what I say. I have to. And I fear. And one of the reasons is, is that we want our pulpits to be softballs. We want our pulpits to stand and just lob feel-good messages toward the plate. And lob how to be a better person in 10 steps. And lob how to reach your dreams in 30 days. 
and lob how to be a millionaire in a week. And they want softballs. But baby, this world is not throwing softballs. They're throwing 90 mile an hour fastballs at the head of the church. And here we are expecting softballs to come in from the pulpit. I did not come to raise up a soft and weak church. God raised me up in this moment uh, to raise up and see and oversee the raising up of a glorious bride for whom he will return. And, and we say, well, keep the politics out of the church. That's the problem. You think, this is, you think a baby in the womb is political. You think a baby in the womb is a Republican. Or it's a Democrat. The fact of the matter is a baby in the womb is a life. And God's got a plan for it. And, and, and uh, okay. All right. Y'all with me still? Okay, cool. So we've talked about Molech. And we've talked about how this came to be in the same spirit that's alive today. And God raised up a man named Josiah who went in as a king. And the Bible said he did a right which was in the eyes of the Lord. And he cut down the high places. And after Josiah, you never read of Molech again until Acts chapter 7 when Stephen is rebuking the people for their child sacrifice. And I pray that God would raise us up Josiah's who will come after that spirit of Molech in Jesus' name. So I think just as important that we preach that God is love, is what his word says in 1 John, as much as we preach that God is merciful, when you read things like Proverbs chapter 6, I want him to throw it up. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 16, I want to read it to you. I'm going to throw it up on the screen here in a minute. These six things the Lord hates. I think when I read the Lord hates something, I ought to pay attention. And then he makes, takes it a step further. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Now, we're here dealing with one today. But I would be a terrible exegetical and expository teacher if I did not tell you you need to read this entire text and make sure your heart is pure of every single one of these but we're dealing with one the Lord hates a proud look a lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood one translation says the shedding of innocent blood the next scripture said that he hates hearts that devise wicked plans now, I, I want to really dive into this for a moment. This, this word hates, it means to abhor, to detest, to loathe, to be hostile toward. Have a feeling of open hostility or intense dislike. That means God is directly opposed to it. He is directly opposed. The, the word abomination means repulsive to the shedding of innocent blood this word innocent means pertaining to one free of blame and not guilty a person morally pure or guiltless and the most pure and innocent among us a baby in the womb did nothing doesn't know any better can feel everything has a heartbeat but a choice is made to kill a baby Y'all were with me a minute ago and now you've left. And, and, and we think that God is somehow meh about it. We think that God is indifferent toward it. We feel like God, and listen, again, he's not indifferent toward women who've had an abortion. He loves them. He loves them. And he, but he is also not indifferent toward the act of abortion. He hates it. And you say, well, what about life outside the, the, the womb? I'm going to get there in a minute. Just chill. But right now I'm talking about the one in the womb. And we hear things like my body, my choice. What that, what that logic fails to realize is that baby is not your body. 
that baby is not like an appendix. It's not like a gallbladder. It's not like a kidney. It is a life. It has a DNA code of its own. It is a baby connected to a placenta. And, 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 uh, and we get to the root of the choice being made, whether in marriage or out of marriage, to have the act of procreation. The choice has already been made. And we get to the root of this, and the root of this is sin, and the root of this is brokenness, and the root of this is rejection and pain. And I know the answer to it all, and his name is Jesus. I mean, I mean, the Bible speaks specifically to life in the womb. I told you, Exodus 21, 22, God called it a child, not a fetus. Psalm 139, 13, David said, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I, am, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made and marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance even being yet unformed. And this is the part you've got to understand. It speaks to life in the womb. And in your book, all of my days were written and they were fashioned for me. What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to say that when I was formed in my my mother's womb and before I was formed Jeremiah 1 and 5 in my mother's womb God had already written my days in his book and all of my days were fashioned before him I didn't become a, a, a living being when I had a heartbeat I had a purpose before I had a body I had a purpose before I had a mind I had a purpose even before I was conceived God knew me and he called me by my name Call me by name. And, and, and you can feel it. God's heart is broken. Not just because of abortion. But the root issue is that we don't value life. The reason we have racism, we don't value life. The reason there's abortion, we don't value life. The reason that we ignore widows and orphans is because we don't value life. The, we, the reason we drive by homeless people and make up every reason in the world as to why they're not homeless because we heard one story of one guy who was taking money and had a home. We don't value life. God said, let us make man, what? In our image. The woman who had an abortion is just as much the image of God as this preacher who stands up here and preaches the word of God to you today. Come on now. Just as in his image, every African American in this room is just as much in the image of God as this pasty white boy with the microphone up here. But we have been taught to value people at the level they can contribute to society. And that is so American and so anti-Bible. So anti-Bible. God said, whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done it unto me. So God took the least and put them on the same level as him. We don't value life. Or we value life sporadically we're not consistent in our valuing of life and unfortunately we value life along our party lines our school, i don't care we value life along our party lines we puppet what cnn says and we puppet what fox news says and there's this great disparity between, and people will say, well, pastor, how is it that you are able to tick off Democrats and Republicans in one setting? I'll tell you how it is. I'm not Republican or Democrat. I'm part of the kingdom. And the kingdom does not take sides. The kingdom is the side. Some of you are clapping. 
But when we really start digging into stuff, you're not going to like me very much. You're not going to like me very much. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> when I stand up here and, and I tell you that we have been robbed of kingdom authority because we desire influence in political spheres. In other words, we've been bought. And our God is not the God of the Bible. Okay, here we go. I thought it'd be a lot quicker to get into this moment, but here we are. Re being a Republican does not equal being righteous. And being a Democrat does not equal being the devil. Nor does it equal being righteous. And Republican does not equal being the devil. I, I don't care if it's a Republican or a Democrat. Give me somebody who fears God and who will pass policies that align with the kingdom. I'll, I'll vote for them. I'll stand behind them. The polarity is so great. See, this is why, this is why the Tower of Babel, they were so close to building it because they had unity in all things. Can I tell you something about the devil's kingdom? There is not one part of the devil's kingdom that is in division. Not one. They have one goal. But in this room today, there are divisions represented amongst us all. And we wonder why the church has lost its influence and the church and Christianity is on the decline. First and foremost, God said it would happen. We'd be hated of all men for his namesake. I'm not talking about Christianity being popular. I'm talking about Christianity being effective. Efficiency and popularity do not, are not uh, together. There's no correlation, effectiveness, and, and, and popularity. Christianity is becoming decreasingly popular. But anytime there was persecution in the Bible, the church increased in effectiveness a hundred and thousand times over because pressure produces power. And I, I told my wife this on Friday night. I believe, and you, you, can, you can call me fanatical, you can call me radical, you can call me out of my mind. I believe that with this ruling, a demarcation has been made in the spirit. I set before you life and death. Choose life. A demarcation has been made in the spirit. And, and times are going to get increasingly darker. And the light of, that's in you is either going to get blended in because it's not that bright. Or it's going to shine in the darkness and light the world up. And, and it, it has nothing to do with what political party you use. You, you, I almost said serve. It's a good word. Because we try to serve our politics and we try to serve the kingdom and we're frustrated because we have no authority. Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. You'll serve one and hate the other or you'll hate one and love the other. You can't serve two masters. The kingdom suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Jesus came not with a sword of peace, but with division. It doesn't, and, and so many people read that. Well, didn't, didn't Paul say to mark those who cause division? Or Jesus say that? And then he said that I bring a sword of division. Yeah, he did, but he does, they don't mean the same thing. He's saying that his word and the kingdom, it's going to be so clear who the sheep are and who the goats are and we are coming into that time now I don't care listen I don't care if you're registered one way or the other all I know is is that when you get the revelation of the kingdom and the king you serve you'll look at the Democrats and say I don't agree with that and you'll also look at the Republicans and say, I don't agree with that. And you'll look at the Democrats and say, they got a good point. And you'll look at the Republicans and say, that kind of aligns with the kingdom. And you'll find yourself standing in the bloody middle. And when people are trying to push you to take a side, you stand your ground and say, no, no, no. I'm on the kingdom side. The question is not, Joshua, before his biggest battle came into contact with the captain of the Lord's host and he asked him, whose side are you on? And God said, I'm the captain of the Lord's host. And you say, what does he mean? He means, I'm not on your side or their side. I'm on my side. 
And it doesn't matter whose side I'm on. It matters whose side you're on. Okay. All right. So we've come to the place that God hates the shedding of innocent blood. And it has its root in the fact that we have been taught to devalue life. Based on skin color, based on upbringing, based on what they can cr- contribute to society. So, so I come here and I ask this question today of the Holy Spirit. And I asked him the past couple of days, what is our response? What is the response of the people of God? And I, I didn't just mean the people of God. I, I'm, God, what is the response of the potter's house? I, I don't have a lot of influence with other people out there. I have influence here though. And if I don't shepherd here well, I'll stand before God. If I don't speak the truth to you, I I take you back. I know we've not really hit it. It was really just a launching pad, but I take you back to our theme scripture, Esther 414. Who knows that if you did not come into the kingdom for such a time as this, here's my interpretation. We were made for this moment. And how we respond to this moment will determine the future for generations. Our response, number one, I got four things. My wife is going to come help me do the last one. Number one is, I just think we need a baptism of Christ-likeness in the church. It's awfully quiet. We just need people to stand up and not be so obsessed with being right. But be obsessed with being like him. Be obsessed with loving the least of these. Be obsessed with saying, my hope is not in the Supreme Court. My hope is not in the presidency. My hope is not in the government. My hope is in the name of the Lord. In whom I trust. To be Christ-like. To love like he loved. To minister like he ministered. To take the least likely. The ones who could not contribute to society. And bring them up on a level where they are honored in the same way. That kings and priests and presidents are honored. Number two. I, I wrote this. Seeing as how I wasn't sure that I was preaching at this campus until late Friday night, yes, all this came together in the last 36 hours. So when I say I was praying yesterday, I was praying for my dear life. Lord, I need you to speak to me. I was praying and I just felt the Lord say, tell the church to make Micah 6-8 their mantra. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly before your God. The word justice here means a state or condition of fairness in disputes. It's taking what is wrong and making them right. I know in this day and age that justice is all over the place. Social justice, sociological justice, When I read the Bible as it pertains to justice, I recognize that the Holy Spirit, listen to me, the Holy Spirit does more than just make us one. He makes us equal. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. He makes us equal. There's not one skin color greater than the other there's not one upbringing upbringing better than the other when you come into the kingdom we all find our commonality in the cross and salvation in the cross was whosoever will and then when he poured out his spirit he took the least likely in peter who was a cussing aggravated angry sailor and he made him a preacher of the gospel and he elevated him to a level by which we are all not just one but equal 
and, and, and justice makes the wrong things right. And I read in the word in Psalm 89 where the Bible said the foundation of God's throne is righteousness and justice. So if there is no justice, biblical justice, if there is no righteousness, then the kingdom of God cannot be established in a city. Because his throne has the foundation of justice and righteousness. Y'all still with me? So to do justice. What does it mean to do justice? It means to look at everybody and see we're one in the spirit. God looks at us and he loves us all the same. To look at yourself and to say, who am I that he is mindful of me? That he rescued me from my sin and can he not do the same with another? That I, I, I'm no better than the homeless man or the, the widow or the orphan or, or the broken or the drug. I'm no better than them because here's the deal. From dust we all came and to dust we'll all return. So I treat people like Jesus treated them. Number two, he said to love kindness. My God, we need kindness. Again, I tell you, I was absolutely appalled, not at the reaction from the world, but from the church. Of people who are ardent believers that were calling each other names and cursing at each other. Some of you sit in this room right now. Better let the conviction of God get on you. He said to love kindness. The word kindness here means mercy or goodness. Philippians 4 and 5 said, let your gentleness be known to all men. Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I'm going to say it again because in this day that we live in, we value. We value being right. More than we value reconciliation and for all the people in the room who love being right husbands do not look at your wives and wives don't look at your husbands I know some of the husbands are that way too for those in the room who value being right I heard a preacher say one time and it could have been my wife but she's a preacher too so but they said I lost my right to be right when I came to the cross, I surrendered my right to be right. Because in the gospel, hmm, thank you, Holy Spirit, Paul wrote to, to Timothy and said, I have given unto them the ministry of reconciliation. Not the ministry of rightness, the ministry of reconciliation. So it's real quiet in the room because some of you are being convicted right now by the Holy Spirit. Even me preaching this, convicted by the Holy Spirit. I don't want to be more right than I am reconciled with God and with my brother. So love kindness. And then the third thing he said was to walk humbly. Walk humbly. Uh, it means to lack pretentiousness or pride. It does not mean that we cease to speak the truth. It means that we speak the truth in love. Yes? We speak the truth in humility from the lowest part in the room. So number one, we become Christ-like. Number two, we take up Micah 6, 8 as a mantra. Number three, we continue to pray. The battle is just beginning. Now it goes to the states, so we pray God raise up governors. Come on. God raise up lawmakers. God, raise up supreme courts in other states that will stand for life. God, raise up men and women who will pass pro-life laws that make adoption easier and more accessible to people who want to adopt. Mm. And number four, and this is, I'm going to spend some time here. Will you bear with me? Will you give me just a few more minutes? Number four. Do not miss the moment you were made for. Take action. 
Some of you say, wow, that took a real political turn right there. No, no, let me tell you something. Because the time has now come where if the walk doesn't match the talk, we're in for a rude awakening. Let me, let me show you something. I want them to throw the next picture up on the slide. I want to show you something. This is a picture that I took in 2021 in Chattanooga, Tennessee. This is the National Memorial for the Unborn. It is the only memorial in the United States that is made to the unborn. What you're looking at are 30,000 rocks that represent 30,000 babies who were aborted on that ground. That building used to be a Planned Parenthood. Here's what happened. The churches took action. They bought the Planned Parenthood and they demolished it. And they erected a memorial to every child that was aborted on those grounds. So what once was a place of death is now a place of life. Show the next picture. It's the, it's the same thing. This right here is, is it's heartbreaking. I've stood on these grounds twice. And you enter through this gate and you can feel the reverence. And the moment you enter into the building, you, you can't, I mean, immediate tears. And, and this is why I say we take action, because what you see here, these teddy bears, these, these letters, these names, were bought and brought by parents who chose to have an abortion. Who now understand the ramifications of what they've done. You read, you can pick the letters up and you read them for yourselves. To my unnamed son, I'm so sorry. I didn't know what I was doing. Down, you can't see it in this picture, but down at the far end on this day, there was a baseball glove with a baseball taped in it with a letter from a dad that said, I wish we could play catch. And these are people who do not need to be castrated and ostracized. They need to be loved. And, and they need to have people who know Jesus come alongside them and say, he loves you, and he wants to see you made whole. Um, I want to show you another picture, because over the last couple of days, I've heard people argue, well, what is the church doing? What is the church doing? What they call it, pray the end abortion. What's I want you to throw that last picture up. This, this is a study done by Barna in... 2013, I couldn't find an updated one, and so I'm hoping this ruling provides an updated number list. This, these are the percentages of every adult that they surveyed for this survey. On the bottom, the top are the part of the group that said they were practicing Christians. Listen to this. 2% of all adults said they would adopt a child, but 5% of believers said that they would. 26% of all adults have said they seriously considered adoption, while 38% of Christians said they've seriously considered adoption. Only 2% of all adults have been a foster parent, while 3% of Christians have been a foster parent. 11% of people have seriously considered fostering, while 31% of Christians have considered fostering. I show you this so that you will recognize our moment is upon us, church. Oh, I know. And, and there's some of you today that you sit there and you think, well, that's not what God called me to. This is true religion, pure and undefiled. And here's how the American version would read. That you dance and shout and speak in tongues in church on Sunday morning. That you prophesy to your neighbor. That you shake hands and you give. 
No, 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 no. True and un- religion, pure and undefiled, is that you care for the widow and the orphans. So this is twofold. Number one, put that, put that back up for me. This is twofold. These numbers are not enough. Okay. Those numbers are not enough. But number two, don't let anybody tell you that the church is not ready to do it. Don't let anybody tell you that. And, and I began to remember something that, that my dad preached one time and from the book, The Rise of Christianity, how Christianity spread. Rodney Stark is a sociologist and he writes it from that point of view. And he takes a look at how the third century church, during plagues and during problems, how Christianity exploded in the third century. And, and it, it had primarily to do with three reasons. Number one was that the third century church treated women better than the world treated them. In that era, in that culture, women were second class, but the church said, you're not second class here. Number two was that during the plagues, they would take people and they would throw them into the streets and roads and, 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 and either they were sick or they were dead. But when they were sick or dead, the church would pick them up, take them home and love them. The, the, Rodney Stark quotes the bishop of Alexandria whose name is Dionysus. And he says, the church, listen to me. I, I, listen, if you've not listened to anything else I've said the rest of this day, listen to me now and Holy Spirit, grip your heart. The church never spared themselves. They were infected by others with disease. Drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pain. Then the third was their stance against abortion and child sacrifice. In the third century, it was... A well-practiced tradition by the Greeks and Romans that if a baby was born and it was deficient or if it was a female, they would take their babies and they would put them outside of their houses and just lay them in the streets so that they would either die from the elements or wild animals would come and kill them. But the third century church would be walking down those same roads And where they saw a baby given up to die, they'd pick that baby up, take it home, and adopt it. Not only would they adopt the babies that were thrown out into the street, if there were families in their community who couldn't afford to support another child, they would take the baby. Even at at their own demise, even if they couldn't afford another baby, their belief in the scriptures their interpretation of the gospel led them to more than just a sunday morning expression it led them into a lifestyle of christianity and you know I, i'm this and so the whole point of that book was that when the plagues were over when that era had run its course, Christianity had exploded. People were being saved. Revival was happening. And they contributed top to those three things. Outside of prayer and fasting, we all know revival can't happen without prayer. Awakening can't happen without prayer and fasting. But the feet to the prayer, they treated women as first class. They, they didn't spare themselves. And they stood strong against abortion. And so their community recognized this people is different and I want to be like them. Which if we're doing it right, means they want to be like him. And today, I'm going to introduce something to you because I I, I don't stand up here and say get involved, get involved, take action, take action. And and then we're not going to do anything. There's something that God has laid on our heart, and we were going to wait until the fall to introduce this. But we're going to introduce it to you so you can pray, and then in the fall, we're really going to dive into it. It's a ministry called My Village Ministries, and the best way to show you what it is is to show you a video. So I'm I'm asking you, please, this is such an important day, 
to stay with me until we're done with service. we got announcements and offering to do, and we're going to take an offering today for this ministry. But I want you to give your attention to the screen for a moment. I was working and trying to finish my GED, but I had to drop out because I was so overwhelmed with the kids being home for school and not being able to get any help. Single mom of three who finished her GED while her kids were hosted by NVM. She was fighting the EMTs off of her and crying because she didn't want to go to the hospital and let her kids enter foster care. Host mom through MVM who hosted two girls while their mama got the medical care she needed and was reunited with her kids two days later. My doctor wanted me to go to the hospital yesterday for chest pain, but I had no one to leave my babies with. Single mom of two whose kids were hosted for one night while she got the help she needed. I work nights and their mom left and I can't stay awake to care for them during the day. I need childcare and support, and I don't want to lose my job. Single dad of three. I have had full custody of both my grandchildren since my daughter passed away. I'm overwhelmed and tired and need support. Grandmother of two, who has a host family to support her through MVM. My landlord won't fix the broken things in our apartment. I'm going to sleep in the park, but I don't want my baby to have to do that. Single mom of a sweet boy who was hosted through MVM. My baby is due in three weeks, and I have nowhere for my kids to be while I'm at the hospital giving birth. I don't want them to be scared. Single mom of three, now four, who is facing giving birth alone after she immigrated from Haiti. I have to say how grateful and blessed I am to have the girls' host family still in their lives. I can call them when I have questions, the girls can talk to them whenever, and they still watch the girls on weekends. If it wasn't for them opening their home and going through what they had to to get the girls, I may not have the girls right now. Mom staying at a homeless shelter while she worked to get housing. When I grow up, I want to be just like you. I want to love Jesus and help people who need a family. Eight-year-old girl sharing her future dreams with her host mom. She has started to take down her walls and trust me as her mentor. I love being able to be someone she looks up to and get to intentionally listen to her and share God with her. One of our mentors sharing about a beautiful relationship being built. My favorite part of the LEC is the devotional. It's so cool that God has a plan for my life. 12-year-old boy who participated in our Learning Extension Center with his MVM mentor. The voice you hear is a Melody Marshall, and those are real stories from our community right here. And um, this ministry is just an answer to prayer for our community, and we have an amazing opportunity to stand stand up in this moment and partner with them. My village ministry seeks to provide family preservation through biblical hospitality. When a family faces a crisis, it makes it difficult for them to deal with their children. I call the referral line through My Village Ministry and find a host home that is able to host their children for a short period of time until they are back on their feet. During this time, the referring parent never loses custody of their children and has the right to be reunited with them whenever they desire. They will also be able to remain close to remain in close contact with them during the entire hosting. See, My Village Ministries has five main objectives, and their number one is just to prevent childhood abuse and neglect. And the two main reasons that those happen is because of stress or crisis in the home and because of social, social isolation. These are issues that the church has an opportunity to address. They also want to prevent unnecessary foster care placements. Most of the calls that they get are predominantly medical crises. So a mom, she's about to give birth. She is dilated to 10 centimeters, and they get a call from a hospital. This is their number one call that says, if you're not here in the next 10 minutes, I have to call Children's Services because her other kids are here, and she has to go deliver this new child. And so what just started as a medical crisis is now tearing a family apart. And if just somebody steps in and hosts those kids for one night, two nights, this family gets to go back together and they have support and a community around them to support them moving forward. Their third main objective is to prevent, reduce, and repair childhood trauma. 
When a child experiences trauma, it can impact a child's ability to connect, attach, and relate to people. Those are life-term problems. By coming alongside these families in crisis, we reduce the traumatic impact on a child. Their fourth objective is to provide family stabilization family stabilization to the socially isolated that's the church we bring in the socially isolated and they're no longer an island on their own we're there we're there to support them and hug them and love them and their fifth and final objective is to provide holistic care we've seen the system and we've seen what it does and it's it's doing its best job without jesus which has no point. And so this ministry rooted on biblical hospitality is an opportunity where the church can be holistic. It doesn't just look at the child and keep them safe. It looks at the mother and the father and it it says, how can we bring them together? How can we root them on Christ? Their team, My Village Ministry, is unified in their desire to equip the church and to meet the needs of families in crisis in our community. The voice you heard on that video was Melody. She's the co-director of Franklin County. Um, I have an, I've had the opportunity to go to their training. They're an incredible ministry. Part of our first fruits offering that the church gave before we ever took a first fruits was to my village ministry. And we've set up a date for September 11th on Vision Sunday that we're going to do another presentation uh, with a, another co-director, Phil on that Sunday. And on October 20th, we want you to mark that date. We're going to have an interest meeting after service. It'll be open, question and answer. We know it can be scary. We never thought that we would do anything like this. But our yes to God has been the biggest blessing in our home. On November 12th, um, we'll have a My Village training here for host families, uh, community coaches. So there's really five important roles that we need. We need a ministry lead team. We need host families who will bring in um, families in crisis and host these children. We need community coaches to work alongside that family. And then we need a huge care community that can help with meals, that can help buy a car seat, that can help buy diapers, um, that can be a resource, that can take family pictures, that that you would be surprised how many families don't have family pictures. Um, Everything we can to bring that family together. And then that fifth piece is a mentor, someone to walk alongside that child as they grow and make sure they stay rooted in Christ. Uh, Christ and the family as a whole.